Hey, everybody. Welcome back for this extra special episode. We're going to break the mold. We're going to deviate from our normal MO and bring you something truly exciting. This is another fishbowl episode, so for anyone who has been listening this year, you've heard a few of these episodes that we recorded on the exhibit floor at VMX. But for this one, instead of being joined by a subject matter expert to talk about a specific specialty or a specific disease condition, I was joined by a bunch of subject matter experts on veterinary medicine in general, and that's you guys. From industry to shelter, from small animal medicine to exotics to government work, and people all over the country from the Bahamas to Canada, we were joined by so many amazing individuals who came in and shared their stories. So for this episode, we opened up the booth and we asked attendees to come in and talk about their experiences in vet med, the animals they connect with the most, the cases they most enjoy, what what kind of wakes them up in the morning and keeps them coming back every day. And let me tell you, I'm, I was just blown away by the conversation. The answers you guys came up with were just so amazing and inspirational. No one knew we were gonna pull him into the booth and ask him questions. I mean, don't get me wrong, we didn't like wrestle anyone into the booth. This was all completely voluntary. But it was not scripted, it was not rehearsed, it was completely spontaneous. And the amazing answers people came up with on the spur of the moment Gosh, it was just so encouraging to hear the love and the passion and how much of a spark there truly is in veterinary medicine. So I don't have a bio for you guys, but maybe you'll recognize your own voice, the voice of a friend, the voice of a colleague. And I hope that everyone listening to this episode finds it as truly fun and inspirational as I did. It was the coolest experience. I really hope we get to do it again next year because like I said, it just blew me away. Let's go ahead and jump in so you guys can hear it too. Welcome to the podcast booth. Let's start off. Can you tell us your name and where you practice? Yeah, my name is David Erke and I practice in Homer Glen, Illinois. I'm Jennifer Ogney Stevenson. I'm from uh, California. My name is Deandra Delancey Milford and I'm from the Bahamas. My name is David Shapiro and I live now in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm Michelle DaCosta, and I'm from Burlington, Ontario, in Canada. My name's Megan Barrett, and I'm from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Kendra Chambers. I practice in West Columbia, South Carolina. My name's Nelson Bricker, and right now I'm working out of Laurel, Maryland. So the first question I ask, aside from, of course, getting everybody's names, was sort of a warm-up, a softball question to get everybody comfortable in my cozy little fishbowl. But I was really pleasantly surprised at some of the thoughtful responses that I got. What's your favorite type of animal to work with? Your heart animal, the one you identify with the most? Are you talking breed or just whatever uh, dogs? Do- do- yeah, yeah, okay, dogs. I agree. I'm also a dog person. Cat. A cat. Gotta be a cat. Oh, every time. I love that. Yep. No, do you have cats? I have one. You have currently. one cat. Okay. Yeah, but I have a greyhound also, who is basically a giant cat. Yes. So <laughs> maybe you could say I have two cats. Dogs. I just feel the strongest bond with them. You know, that's like kind of a kind of easy one, but get each other. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Do you have a favorite kind of dog? Do you have a I, dog at home? No, yeah, I have a few dogs. Yeah, I don't discriminate against breeds. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we have three dogs at home. Oh, like busy. Love. Yeah, love them all equally. They're couch potatoes, which is nice. So. I actually don't have a favorite animal. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually people. I get that question a lot, and. I don't have a favorite animal. All creatures great and small. Love them all. I love them all. Dogs, for sure. I kind of like that um, dogs definitely express their emotions openly. Sure. I love how they come in and if they're happy, they're happy. If they're scared, they're scared. And you can almost read most of them like an open book. There's no real, what am I getting into? And I think I really, yeah, I really um, appreciate that and definitely can adjust myself to what I'm going to be getting into. My heart animal, I guess, would be the Yorkshire Terrier. Oh, I love that. Yes, they're little, tiny, but mighty. They are. That's the truth. That's the truth. Do you have a Yorkie? I do. Oh, what's the, his I have two name. of them. Oh, actually. what are their names? <laughs> I have a. Um, the newest to the family is gonna be Marcel, and he is small, 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 and he is so sweet. And I have a little female. Her name is Mia, and she's spicy. Um, He's about three pounds. Oh, my gosh. And she's six. Oh, they're just itty-bitty things. Yes. 
Definitely cats. Yeah. 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 I love dogs, but there's just something about cats where they just, there's no, I don't know. They just have so much more personality when you get to know them. The more I learn about cat behavior mm-hmm. and all the different nuances that they have, the more I love cats. Yeah. I'm like, these like weird little aliens that yep. I just love them so much. Yep. And you just <laughs> cater to them 24-7. Yes. They give you nothing back. No. They expect so much. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yep. They are the, the most advanced species on the planet. 100%. Like, what other 100%. animal could show up at your house and be like, I'm moving in? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yep. okay. And give you nothing. And yes. give you nothing. Yes. Yep. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. My heart animal. This is my worst question. I always tell people I cannot choose my favorite animal. I have such a struggle with this because I love so many of them. And so it, I will say I got into vet medicine because I wanted to help like wild animals to start with. And I really like, and I've always had a lot more of the actually reptile and amphibian kind of animals. Okay. And uh, I'll just say that I really am going to just associate myself with an American toad. An American toad. Yeah, I just that like is the, the first hunker American down. American toad. I answer we've had. And wait in a little hole, and that's great. That's I love fine. it. I love it. Oh my gosh, that's such a good answer. Hunker down, hide in a little hole. So I'm going to go with maybe you're an introverted personality? Um, I like to get out too. That's why it's hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, my wife is more of an introvert than me. Okay. And definitely she would like that side of me a lot more <laughs> if we all just sort of stayed homebodies. I love that. I think we both like, but are maybe taxed by you know, some excitement outside with everybody. I can relate to that so much. Like, like the, the extroverted introvert kind of feel. It's a constant battle. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And then, and then you like, I feel like you almost set a precedent when you're out amongst people and like, yeah, come out. And like, then you just hit this point where you're like, I can't just everybody leave me alone. <laughs> and good night, everyone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into American toad status now. Yeah, that's okay. So of course, now I want to know how many of you, like me, will be adopting American toad status into your daily vernacular. Okay, for the next part of the interview, we dove into something that hits a little bit harder, required some thought, a little bit tougher question. We've probably all dealt with the roller coaster of public perception of vet med at some point in our careers. I know when I was first starting vet school, They told us that veterinarians are some of the most trusted medical professionals out there. And that's probably still true to a degree, but over the years we've seen things like cyberbullying and just, you know, kind of a complete lack of understanding of what it is that we actually do as veterinarians. So I wanted to dive into that conversation with all of you, with my peers. And it sounds like while truly bridging the gap of understanding between the general public and what it is that we really do as veterinarians is always going to be a work in progress, these conversations left me just feeling even more compassion towards this field that I love so much and the amazing colleagues that are a part of it. What's one thing you wish the general public knew about veterinary medicine? I wish they knew that at the end of the day, we're there to help them. Um, And we're really there because we want to help their pets. I feel like sometimes there's always that um, kind of negative connotation that we're in it for the money or we're in it because we get kickbacks. But really, at the end of the day, I mean, that's nowhere near in the top 100 reasons we're getting out of bed in the morning. So I do wish they would remember, hey, we're we're on your team, right? We're we're all in this together. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're we're really here because we care and we really do enjoy what we do. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, how hard veterinarians work. I just don't think they realize, you know, they see you for five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, big cases, maybe more, but they don't understand how hard we work hours wise. They, you know, it's a pretty tough job sometimes. Absolutely. It's not just playing with puppies and no, kittens all day. definitely not. <laughs> um, at least from the shelter perspective, the whole no kill thing. I think there's misperceptions. They think it's that no animal should be euthanized at all in a shelter setting. Unfortunately, we look after the dog's best, dogs or cats or any other animal's best interest. And there still is room for putting animals asleep when the quality of their life is suffering. And I think, I wish people understood that more is that we're doing what's best for the animals. It's not about just, we don't just euthanize animals just because. Like there's, there needs to be a reason for, for that. If they're suffering a lot, it's often a compassionate gift that we can provide. It's not just the inflammatory term killing. We don't do that. I'm so glad that I asked you that question. Like that's a, a really insightful answer that I think 
maybe being not in the shelter medicine area, maybe sometimes we forget how hard that is for our colleagues that are in shelter med to, to deal with that stigma and have to, and, and those layers of communication. Mm-hmm. All right, so transitioning from a little bit tougher question, I thought it was the perfect time to pivot to the why, the what keeps us all coming back every day to this this job that is admittedly very difficult, but such an amazing career. What's your why? What's get, what gets you out of bed in the morning and, and keeps you getting up in this field of vet med and, and doing what you do? I guess it's just... Uh passion that I've had from I was a little girl. Um, From I was 12, I knew that I wanted to be a veterinarian. I was in class and, you know, we kind of went around the room and did introductions. And another classmate said she wanted to be a veterinarian. And I thought in my mind, that sounds actually pretty good. I think at that time I said I wanted to be a journalist. Okay. I would have never succeeded in that. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, I love animals and I love the sciences. And so from then I said, I think this is the road I'm going down. Right now I'm actually in marine mammals. Some stingrays, some sharks. I work for a facility in the Bahamas that deals with dolphin encounters or you know, um, sea lion encounters. And we just basically practice preventative um, it. You know, We do our quarterlies, our health checks, and um, we monitor daily, of course, and it's pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, you get to wake up in the morning, and man, those are some neat animals Never to get Never a dull with. moment. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's the animals, it's that relationship, it's what they bring to all of our lives. You know, we growing up with animals, that was always I mean, the first thing you do when you get out of bed, right? You're snuggling with your animal, you're petting them, it's they just bring so much. So being able to take care of them and improve their lives improves all of our lives. So that's, I mean, probably my biggest why. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I have a, um, a four-year-old and she just completely ignores my husband and I in the morning yep. and goes straight for the dog. Yep. <laughs> Every time. I'm very extroverted. So I do love going out, chatting with all the people and really kind of working together to help either calm them, fix what's going on with their pets. I just love those relationships as much as they're draining at times. I really do appreciate them at the end of the day. I feel like that is such a such a good why, because there's so much human interaction in Absolutely. practice. So, you know, when you can really thrive off of that and get energy from it, then yeah, it makes it a lot more fun. Yeah, it's something usually I hear the converse and some days absolutely I feel that sure. way. But at the end of the day, I, I love the relationships I form with my clients. New stuff. Yeah, so that, that, and that lifelong ke- learning. Yes, and that keeps me going because I, I learned something new. It's cool for the practice. Yeah. You know, that sort of stuff. So, Do you have anything on the horizon where you're like, I'm doing all these cool things. I really want to learn this next. Well, it's tough because my wife is a rehab specialist. Oh, Like okay. a boarded rehab specialist. Nice. But I do a lot of work for them, joint injections, things like that. Gotcha. So I learn stuff that sometimes I don't use in my practice, but I use in her practice. That's so cool. Those are some lucky patients that get to have surgery and then go straight to a, a yeah, boarded Yeah, so rehab. we've been doing nuclear medicine lately, which is a lot of fun. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. So that keeps me going, too, is if I'm not doing anything exciting on my side, I'll go sneak over to her side. <laughs> I love that. I love that. A good, good partnership there. Other than that, I just like seeing people. I've, you know, I think every veterinarian that's successful is a good people person, right? You know, you got to be able to talk to people and engage with them and of course i love the i love the animals yeah i love that i agree the people are one of my favorite parts as well which i never thought would be the case and it turns out that's a that's a really fun part of the job yeah it is so i'm curious what's your why what keeps you guys coming back for me i really have to echo some of the answers that we heard here That amazing client relationship is a huge part of what keeps me coming back every day as much as it is about the animals. Who knew this part-time American toad introvert is actually a little bit of a people person? Okay, from here we switched gears a little bit and we dug into cases, favorite cases, nightmare cases, everything in between. This is always such an interesting discussion hearing from everybody. For me, it's fairly cut and dry. I I love dentistry, I love medicine. Keep me away from any surgical abdomens. Taylor, if you're listening, our spay experience the other day proves that this is true. So next question, 
what is like your favorite case to manage? Like, what do you see come through the door and you're like, yes, this is what I want to see today? Loaded question. I say five o'clock come around and then you're like, that, that's what I want to see come question. today. <laughs> yeah. No, I just really, really admire those owners that stick with it. I have a client. We've been dealing with a skin case now for about a year and a half, actually. Um, the, the, the hair fell off all the way on the little paw pads, all the way around his muzzle, his neck, and everything. But it was a it was a very difficult case because this pet lived with her mother. Okay. Um, the mother could not really take care, do the treatment. We were prescribing the medication. I'm like, are the meds being given? Because it will come back like, no difference or worse. Right. Finally, the daughter was able to talk with the mother and able to kind of rehome it to her house in order to give the medicine. And now the dog is looking great. Oh, I love that. And I said, well, when are you going to let her have him back? She says, I'm really thinking hard about it because we really <laughs> had a lot of work to get him to this point. But she takes him over it weekly so mom can still, you know, see him and things good. like that. So, Oh, good but job. But that was... Oh, yes. When you're like, we fixed it. We finally fixed it. Oh, that's awesome. I like the ones that have generally that quick resolution. I find that, you know, like the induced vomitings or like the foreign body surgeries that go very smoothly or, you know, the um, episioplasties that you do, the ones that have the quick resolution, I find very rewarding. I like doing the long term cases, but I find that when people come in and they leave and there's that kind of almost instant fix, they you made the pet feel better, you made the owner feel better, and it's those are the ones I enjoy the most. Absolutely, absolutely. I love that answer. It sounds like you might be a little bit braver in surgery than I am. Do you like doing surgery? Uh, it depends on the day. That's it depends fair. on That's a lot fair. of factors, but yeah, in general, yes. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, do you have a favorite kind of surgery when um, you're having a surgery day? Yeah, I love the episioplasties, which sounds like such a weird thing, like no. the vulvoplasties, where, yeah. because you make such a big difference. It requires like all this finesse and fine techniques. And at the end, you're like, it's and this dog is going to feel so much so better, so much better. It's not irritated, the UTIs. And it's, again, that quick, easy fix where you've done something, you know, short term that's going to make a huge difference long term for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. What about the flip side? What are you what comes through the door and you're like, oh, boy, skin. Okay. Skin. Done. Yeah. Do you see a lot of skin <laughs> so in So much skin. Yeah. So much skin. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have, have the monopoly on skin here in Florida. No, no, no. <laughs> Even where it's cold, there's a lot of allergies to everything. That makes sense. Ours might be a bit more seasonal, though, because, sure. you know, in the winter, sometimes you get a bit of a break and then all of the itchy dogs come in in the spring and the summer. And, and it's just, it. yeah. And then so like, yeah, the summers, you just want to take the whole couple months off because right. there's so many that come in. I remember um, my friend was when we were graduating, she was like, that's it. I'm moving to Arizona, mm -hmm. so I don't have to treat skin anymore. Turns out they treat skin in Arizona, too. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. Every, you can't escape it. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Can I ask you, like, what's the wildest case you ever managed or or, oh or even, you know, even taking it away from clinical practice? Like what's what's just the wildest thing that's ever happened to you in vet med? Where you are like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. Oh, boy, the wildest thing. Um, I had one client who she was a dentist amazing client, amazing family with these beautiful children. And she got these two adorable lab puppies. And she came rushing in one afternoon on emergency. And these little dogs were, they were probably maybe 16 weeks old at that point, you know, four months. And they were both just flat out comatose, like had oh no gosh. idea what was going on with these puppies. And it turns out they had had a police pursuit. They live out in the country and a police pursuit had ended at their house and the suspect got out and as he was running from the police, he threw a package over into their yard and it turned out to be methamphetamines. So these two puppies had gotten into methamphetamines and they ended up doing well. They did oh, great. God. But like it was such a wild story because they just brought these puppies in and had no idea what was wrong with them. So it was I remember that being wow. a pretty wild how did just you unusual that? circumstance. Yeah, that's wild. I, I don't remember. I think it was all like supportive care at that point, you know, diazepam and whatever other sedatives and. I think we ran all kinds of because we didn't know what it was right. like all kinds of blood work and we figured if both of them are involved there's something they got into but we had no idea what and wow that yeah, was pretty pretty crazy yeah that's a crazy case you're a hero you saved the day I, I, yeah i guess i guess <laughs> that, that's, that's what we're there right i was gonna say yeah that's one of the fun parts sometimes yep. sometimes we get to be the hero yep. exactly i've actually been in small animal for a number of years as well and i actually worked in government 
Okay. I was I was the enforcer, you okay. know, <laughs> um, inspecting different clinics and animal facilities and dealing with import and exports. And I would say maybe a lot of my interesting cases would probably be there in terms of the type of animals that people request to bring in. And I would say the craziest request that I've gotten was that someone wanted to bring a reindeer to the Bahamas. What? And they wanted us to facilitate that. Oh, no. That's it. The, the indigenous reindeer of the of the Bahamas. Right. <laughs> no, they, they don't do well there for a reason, right? <laughs> and of course, we can't outright say no. We said we'll look into it. There we go. <laughs> and six months later, the paperwork had not gone through. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Oh, so that, I would reindeer. say that was one of the craziest ones. Yeah. What were they going to do with a reindeer in the Bahamas? They it wanted like it for photos reindeer? in the Christmas. They even wanted, they wanted an interaction with um, okay. the public, which is even a bigger risk. It, right. was, it was too much of a risk. Sure, sure, <laughs> absolutely. The other day I had a foreign body surgery that I thought was super funny. It was this dog came in, owners were swearing up and down, dog doesn't eat anything. Dog comes in, we do a scope, We well we do x-rays, we do an ultrasound, we do a scope, we end up going to surgery and removing a plastic, like um, soft, fuzzy yellow toy that's supposed to look like a yellow snowball and on it it was written down don't eat yellow snow which i just (laughs) thought was so funny because there was a kit of them that were all little pretend snowman heads and then the one that he was not like don't eat any of them but the one that specifically said don't eat me he ate oh we were killing ourselves (laughs) laughing after that (laughs) oh my gosh i love that yeah so that was like of the recent ones yeah the one that kind of brings a smile to your face that's so much fun he did well recovered oh yeah to not eating yellow snow well he's eaten some other things in the (laughs) couple weeks since his surgery but yeah he's been doing great so far good good yeah no We see a lot of different things over the years, and I think people always think it's fun when you like treat a tarantula for a broken fang or have a a fish come in for a tumor removal. Those things are always kind of wild. We don't get many of them, but they're fun. And I I think those kind of things just help keep a little bit of excitement and shake things up a little bit. Nelson, you are very dynamic. (laughs) (laughs) You've treated a lot of different things. It's the world of emergency. I don't know what to tell you. Okay, so for my wildest case, I probably shouldn't dive into it on here. It involved a corgi, a fence, it was completely ridiculous, but honestly, nothing compared to having to deal with navigating transportation of a reindeer to the Bahamas. I hope these next few questions inspire you as much as they inspire me. Take a listen. So you've been out in practice about 10 years. What is something that you would tell the you of 10 years ago getting into practice? Mm. So 10 years ago, I think that I would have been uh, a lot more gung ho and I would have told myself to settle down a little bit. So I think just taking a step back has always been something I need to keep reminding myself of. And I probably tried to do it a little bit then, but I might have been a little bit more specific as to how I set my plans and just making sure that I knew that the future could kind of have any possibility we were looking for. So it, you know, it's something I might have gotten tunnel visioned in the past. I would have kept my options open more. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Do you feel like you've gotten better at that as time has gone on? Or is that still a conversation you're, you feel like you're having? I think it's something that I always am reminding myself of and that, um, you know, anything that we're doing is something that I think about maybe in the future, but maybe should leave more open-ended than than I do. Advice. Um, Just stick with it. Stick with it. Stick with it. Don't let the the downs pull you down. Just get back up and keep moving. That is such good advice. I'm so glad I asked you that question because I think we all need to hear that from time to time, no no matter how many years we've been practicing. Definitely, because it can get hard at times. But um, don't stay down actually get you some support so you can definitely kind of get back up when you need to because veterinary medicine is hard. It's hard on us. It's hard on us emotionally and it can be challenging at times, but we do have those happy stories to really pick us back up. And when you see that, those clients will be like, oh, great job. I'm so happy. I'm like, I needed that today. Well, 
here I am hosting a podcast channel. And sure enough, if you would have told me this 10 years ago, I would have said, what is a podcast? And never would have believed you that this is part of what I would be doing. So I guess in that regard, I would have told myself, stay open to the possibilities because you never know what's gonna happen in your career and what you're gonna end up really loving. The other thing I wish I would have told myself is it's a marathon, not a sprint. I fell into the classic, I got in too deep, too fast, doing too many things. It was a recipe for burnout and was headed down a tough path. And so I would have reminded myself, just stop and smell the roses. It's a marathon, not a sprint, one thing at a time. Well, we've taken a look at the ghost of Vet Med past. Now let's go forward to hopes, dreams, aspirations in the future and see where we want the field to go from here. What's something that you'd like to see for the future of vet med? Like maybe something you'd like to see change within the span of your career or even just in general? That is a tough question. A tough one. I think in general, I, I would love to see us continue to make it easier for people um, to access pet health care and to continue to make it easier for pets to come to clinics, because I feel like there is very much, especially in cat medicine, um, that reason why a lot of cats don't come to clinic, right? And I think with pre-medication sedations and that sort of thing, we've done a good job, feel away those products out there. Um, but I think there is kind of that hard stop of seeking out that medicine. I mean, every day we hear it, oh, I couldn't catch the cat or I couldn't do this. Yeah. So I would love to see us kind of break that barrier. I'm not sure how we do that. We, I think we've done a great job and even the time I've been a vet, but I would love to see us kind of bring medicine or make it easier for, for people to access the medicine. Super insightful. I did yeah. not realize that was where you were going when you said access to care, because that was where my head went was yeah. access to care, but in a totally different context. And yeah, so, more in like clinical. Yeah. yeah. And no, I, like, you're absolutely right. Like reaching these feline patients and, and making it an, an easier, less stressful, more doable experience to bring cats absolutely. into the clinic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I mean, if they come in 10, six out of 10 stress, there, there's very little we can do with them. And then I find clients just kind of see it as a, it was a very limited exam. I wonder right. why I came today and right. then I spent this money. So I think if we could help them out, yeah, it'd be great. I think it'd be nice to be a little more respected as far as, oh, you're just a doctor for animals. To be on the same level as physicians, um, treated with the same respect from clients, not just expecting to get in that same day all the time to, to weigh it, appreciate our time. So I think Absolutely. we can head in that direction. So yeah. I think it would be better for the profession overall. I think people get too burnt out. They're, just, they're treated badly by a lot of clients, and those clients wouldn't treat their own human doctor in the same way. I think that's a really good answer because I, I love that you said, oh, you're just a doctor for animals. That's if you even get to the point that they realize you're a doctor mm -hmm. and you didn't go to a, a six-month certificate program to yeah, do this. Right. So. <laughs> For me, as far as where I would like to see the field go in the future, I suppose overall, I really wanna support my colleagues in leadership positions. There's so much transition going on right now. I really wanna see all of us take an active role in shaping that future and support each other in being thought leaders going forward. And that includes everyone, veterinarians, technicians, CSRs, practice managers, all coming together to have a collective say in what the future of veterinary medicine is gonna look like. All right, one last story. I didn't know where to put this one, but we definitely couldn't leave it out. This is such a fun story and I learned something from it. So here you go. My last question is how do you treat a tarantula with a broken fang? Well, the main thing is they basically have an open vasculature so they don't have vessels they just have blood floating around their body okay. and if you don't seal that up they just kind of leak out and deflate so oh you need to make sure if anything is broken on them that it's completely removed and that anything that's leaking has some sort of seal over it and okay. uh, usually just for making sure they don't get too upset by things you can do a little bit of isoflooring or some sort of you know way to help sedate them and monitor things but uh, basically, you just seal things up with some tissue adhesive usually, and it's not too hard. It's a lot easier than you might think. Most of the things uh, that we're doing aren't that hard. There are some people that do some really cool stuff with them in the zoo and exotic world, and you know, I'll hope that maybe one day I get an interesting case like that. That's very cool.
I have no desire to ever do that, but I'm glad I know that information now. I'm glad you do. Yeah, that's cool. I learned something about tarantulas. There's nothing to be afraid of. You just sedate them like everything that you think is dangerous, whether it is or not. I have a feeling, like I have a daughter who's like obsessed with bugs. And I'm like, one day she's going to ask me for a tarantula and I don't know what I'm going to (laughs) do. Well, thank you so much for joining me in the fishbowl. So much fun. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. By far and away, one of my favorite experiences. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this episode and uh, I'm going to go into toad mode myself here for a little while. But I'm looking forward to next year because I just love hearing from all of you so much. For more episodes like this, click on the education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dbm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DBM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.